أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا إلا وأنتم مسلمون. Guy has dedicated his career to advocating for human rights and education. Guy is a journalist, the creative director, and the co-founder of the award-winning documentary company Kodak. Kodak is dedicated to creating space for critical thought through the media, and it aims to build a culture defined by free expression, equality, and creativity. So please help me give a warm welcome all the way from London, England, Guy Ganaratne. I'd like to begin by thanking JHR and TMA for inviting me to speak today about the legacy of Malcolm X. It's truly an honor, not only just because I get to spend an evening with all of you here, but also to speak, uh, to speak about a man that I can honestly say is one of the most influential in my life. Those of you who know me know that I tell stories for a living, primarily stories about human rights and society. And as a filmmaker and writer, I often found the words of Malcolm X as a sort of strange solace. And as education is a theme today, I thought I might speak about what Malcolm X has taught me. And for that, we'll begin at the beginning. I was 14 in my high school history class when I first heard the story of this man, Malcolm X. I remember the first picture I saw of him, his face was stern, defiant, and unbowed against a backdrop of history. That is the image that has ingrained itself in my mind. It's also the same image that always resurfaces when someone mentions his name to me. I always think of that day and that image. Now, were there a few stories that would quieten a usually rowdy, apathetic and bored year eight history class at my school in North London. But the day we learnt about Malcolm, silence. We watched as our history teacher, Mr. Wood, would play videotapes of his speeches. I heard his voice for the first time that day. It was intercut with grainy newsreel footage, images of riots and streets ablaze in America. Those images made quite an impression on me, aged 14. It was the 60s, and I'm sure some of you already know the images that I probably saw that day. Images, one wash basin for the whites, another for coloreds. Police dogs and protest and stock images of black men and women, leather jackets, leather gloves, panthers, and the names, Marcus Garvey, Malcolm X, King, Ali. It's difficult to disconnect these names with the times they lived in. But suddenly at the age of 14, History became less about facts and dates and dead monarchs, but more about people and actions and courage and strength. I use the same word now as I did then to describe what I felt in that classroom, but use it today in its true form. It was awesome. He was awesome, truly. I believe that every young man in that class, myself included, at an age where testosterone and anger and pride and a peculiar will to ambition, listened to the story of Malcolm X and placed our faces on his. Such was the nature of his story. That is what I think of when I think of the legacy of Malcolm X, his story. A story that inspires awe and breeds a fire in the gut. His was a torch, extinguished before its time. 
Now I want to speak about this idea of Malcolm X and his story for a minute. Those images, our collective images of that time, are powerful things charged with influence. They can mold the story of a man and his place in history so viscerally that we sometimes are guilty of neglecting the parts that hold less focus. Today I'd like to talk about the chapters of Malcolm's story that many people dismiss as parentheses. And I'll tell you why. Here is a battered old dog-eared version, copy of um, Malcolm X's autobiography. Now I don't know if you're familiar with the story behind the writing of the book. But you know that at the time of its writing, he was one of the most recognizable faces in the world. And he was determined that his story would be told on his terms. Malcolm X and the book's writer, Alex Haley, would actually fight about the interpretation of the events in his life. And the book itself reads as a psychological tale of inner struggle, of a man trying to pick apart his own reflection by describing it. He was organizing his life into a story arc, and it's a story I'm sure lots of you are familiar with. It began on the streets of Harlem, where he turned to street hustling. That period would be followed by his years in jail, his conversion to Islam. And it was then that he became one of the most influential political figures of his time. As his story is told and retold today, it has become a story of many Malcolms. As with most public personalities, we tend to choose which of his contradictory incarnations we prefer to remember. It could be Malcolm Little, the homeboy, the hoodlum, the young Malcolm, the hustler who called himself Red, Malcolm the thief, Malcolm the prisoner, Malcolm the Muslim, Minister Malcolm X, Malcolm the follower, the devotee, Malcolm the anti-white demagogue, and finally, perhaps, Malcolm the martyr. I ask all of you, which of these Malcolms comes closest to your interpretation of him? We define our heroes by their stories, and when I was young, it was the minister Malcolm X that I was attracted to most. His words were so charged with passion and a sense of himself, and I guess as a young man trying to define myself, an image of a, a man with such purpose was inspiring. And his words, his were speeches that inflamed with every word, shocked the status quo and thundered the air. How could anyone at that age not be enraptured? This was Malcolm at his most fierce, but also his most divisive. He made a great impact on me. The Malcolm of that period of his life was all I needed at that point in my life. I became more and more politically active and engaged in discussion about the important issues and debates of the day. But then something happened. I got older. And the older I became, the more and more I read, and the less and less I agreed with that particular incarnation of Malcolm X. The man of that period as Minister Malcolm X of the Nation of Islam said some incredibly incendiary things, some would even say dangerous. <coughs> he was so bound by the nation that I felt less and less enamored with his ideas and he would, as he would in fact become, as he grew out of being a follower and become a true leader unbound by doctrine in his later life. I've often wondered what would have become of my understanding of Malcolm and my own political views if I hadn't read beyond that point. Had I stopped at Malcolm at his most dogmatic? But then I remember coming to a passage in his book where he, almost as an aside, wrote this. People are always speculating why I am as I am. To understand that of any person, his whole life from birth must be reviewed. All of our experiences fuse into our personality. Everything that has ever happened to me is an ingredient. Everything that has ever happened to me is an ingredient. 
Suffice to say, I read on, having understood that Malcolm the angry man on the soapbox was only an ingredient of what he would later become. Now it does, I know, feel strange talking this way of a story and a legacy of a real flesh and blood man that walked the earth. But such is the weird fascination we have over our icons that we allow ourselves to define them and be defined by our alignment with them. But the thing I learnt was that Malcolm X was someone who was constantly learning, examining and re-examining his own views, thinking critically about how he saw the world around him. It made me wonder why we don't do the same when we discuss his life and his legacy. Why is it when we think of Malcolm, we always gravitate towards that one image? This was a man for whom education meant keeping an open mind that it was necessary for the intelligent search for truth, as he called it. He was dedicated to intense study of himself as well as the world he lived in. A man like this is destined never to stay the same. I ask today to try to re-examine Mal Malcolm's story and thus reassert his legacy for our times. For I believe there is a far more provocative powerful incarnation of Malcolm X that most people have barely gotten to know. It's the Malcolm of his final chapters, no longer the familiar personality of his nation days. The Malcolm of his final chapters was, yes, a moderate. The man whose insatiable curiosity had, let, had him leave the United States, broadening his horizon still further when in 1964 he made his Hajj, his pilgrimage to Mecca. The Malcolm whose experience in the Holy Land had changed him. As always, we go to his words. In a public letter sent from Mecca, Malcolm X writes about his life changing experience. In his words, you can hear almost the sense of relief he feels, having seen a form of brotherhood that encompasses whites and blacks, something he thought never possible. He writes, Throughout my travels in the Muslim world, I have met, talked to, and even eaten with people who in America would have been considered white. I have never before seen a more sincere and true brotherhood practiced by all colors together. He goes on to say, you may be shocked by these words coming from me. But on pilgrimage, what I've seen and experienced has forced me to rearrange much of my thought patterns and toss aside some of my previous conclusions. Despite my firm convictions, I have always been a man who tries to face facts and to accept the reality of a life as new experience and new knowledge unfolds it. He signed the letter not as Malcolm X, but as el Haj Malik el-Shabazz yet another transformation. Education is the constant rearrangement of conviction. This is what Malcolm's story teaches us. An openness of mind that allows you to transform yourself again and again, forces you to shake loose the rigidity of thought. You get the sense that this is the Malcolm X that he himself wanted to be defined by, that this was what those ingredients of past experience had led him towards, that moment in Mecca, where he saw the truth staring up from in front of him, that the struggle he had dedicated his life to, the struggle of civil rights, was actually a struggle of human rights. This is the final lesson he left us with, a lesson that many of our political figures today could do well to heed. It's the difference between principle and absolutism There are those who, through some indefinable quality, can grasp the narratives of their own time, brilliant minds that can command their will to a purpose. That is what Malcolm shows us is possible with his story, not a part of his story or a period of his story, but his entire story. The tragedy, though, is that we were robbed of what Malcolm would have become. <laughs> 
a figure in the center ground that called for those in both sides of the racial divide to come together to forge a stronger union. We will never know what that figure of Malcolm would have gone on to achieve. Which brings me to my final point. There are many out there who believe that those who do not prescribe to a fixed political designation, who don't fall on the left or right of a spectrum, but inhabit instead what is derisively termed the gray area in between, lack somehow the same sense of urgency needed for action. They claim that the voices of the center ground uh, are forever condemned to be drowned out by the passion of those on the extremes, as if passion in politics are exclusive to the fringes. Where are the firebrand leaders of the center ground, they ask? Well, how I wish Malcolm would have lived long enough to represent that figure for some of us. For me, Malcolm X is a teacher, a needle on a compass. His story has taught me many things, but the most important lesson, I think, is this. People are not fixed. People are not fixed products of their circumstance. They can change, evolve, transform into better representations of themselves, and so can our politics. By casting ignorance aside and forging ahead with education, by being open to struggling with ourselves sometimes, with constant reevaluation and critical thinking. I finish with a quote in, from Mario Vargas Llosa's The Feast of the Goat that encompasses this most human truth in words better than my own. Nothing that a man has been, is, or will be is something that he has been, is, or will be forever. As many of you here, I'm sure, are still trying to figure yourselves out, are at the beginning of your story, chapter one, first paragraph. You'll choose to prescribe to figures out there who you think have the ability to inspire the best in you. Good teachers or mentors, or indeed public figures like Malcolm who have the ability to influence the way you see the world. Great lives leave an imprint and what I think finally Malcolm's story has taught us is always, always finish the book. Thank you.